So you're going to hear the phrase next slide many times. <laughs> so I work at the Science and Technology Facilities Council, which is one of the UK uh, government-funded research councils, um, one of Europe's largest multidisciplinary labs. Next slide. Um, those of you who don't know what SDFC or what it does, we do science. So we've got in-house scientists doing uh, particle and nuclear physics and astronomy. But we also, importantly, provide facilities to uh, both UK, Europe, and the world um, uh, scientists to, to, uh, to do various things in space, in uh, neutrons, in materials, in, uh, in lasers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there are two science and innovation campuses, one at uh, Harwell near Oxford, which is where I work, and one at Darsbury in the north. Next slide. Um, since April of 2018, we've been, uh, all of the seven research councils are funded under a single umbrella organization now, UK Research and uh, Innovation, together with the other, other bodies there. Um, and there's the map of the various STFC facilities across the UK, and you'll see the, uh, the picture on the bottom right is Rutherford Appleton Lab, the Harwell campus which is also where the, uh, the JISC Janet uh, headquarters office is on that same campus. There are lots and lots of things on that campus. Okay. So the contents of what I'm going to talk about today, um, I want to uh, give a brief introduction, and it has to be brief, to you know, what is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN and the experiments, and importantly, what is the worldwide IT infrastructure we have and the networking and the data transfers that we use both in across the world and here in the UK, that's the Group BP project. Um, and then the main thrust of the talk is to talk about IPv6, use of IPv6, and I'll, you will see that it's been an activity that's been going on a long, long time, and that's one of the messages I want to give you. This was much longer than we imagined it would ever be. It was much more complex. So if you network operators are wondering, why don't people use IPv6? I can give you some of the reasons why um, the non-trivial use of uh, applications on the internet often takes a lot of work to make them IPv6 compliant. And I'll end with some pro problems and lessons learned. I should, however, acknowledge I have not, I've only been coordinating this work. I have lots of uh, highly competent colleagues and enthusiastic people working in the, uh, the IPv6 working group and the various uh, task forces and uh, all of the experts in the experiments and the sites. So my thanks go to them. Um, Two words about me. I am, by background, an experimental particle physicist who got interested in computing, uh, as many people do. Um, many, many years ago, I lead the computing group in the particle physics department at, at RAL. But my, uh, that's my day job. But I've, I have a long, ongoing interest in both security and networking topics. And so um, I was the one who was pushing that we should probably do something about IPv6, and so got the task of chairing the workforce. Okay, so a few words about the Large Hadron Collider. And so here's the, here's the picture. This is uh, Geneva in Switzerland. You can see Lake Geneva um, in the background. You can see Geneva Airport. Every big accelerator has to have its own airport. Um, there are the four big experiments, ALICE, CMS, ATLAS, and LHCB. And we have been just finished what was called Run 2, which was a three-year run um, where we went up to the, uh, the full design energy, but not necessarily the full luminosity. And we were the, all of the experiments together were generating about 50 to 70 petabytes of data per year. Um, that has to be, they actually generate much more than that that's not actually recorded, but that was what was recorded. So that happened during 2015 to 18. And, of course, at the end of run one, the most important thing was the announcement at CERN in July of 2012 of the discovery of the, uh, the Higgs boson, followed the next year by the Nobel Prize in Physics for Englert and uh, Peter Higgs. So how do we do the computing? It was realized very early on that there was no way we could get enough um, compute and data resources at CERN. Um, there was just physically not enough space. And also, of course, all the funding agencies around the world prefer to spend money in their own countries rather than just sending the money to CERN. We already send a lot of money to CERN. But, uh, so it was decided that we re really needed a, uh, a distributed model. And it was at the start of uh, the, all of the excitement about grid computing. So it was decided very early on that WLCG would be a grid, in inverted commas. Today, we have more than 170 computing centers around the world. It's almost impossible to count them. 
It used to be difficult to count PCs, now you can't even count data centers in 42 countries. And the mission of this distributed infrastructure is to store, distribute, and analyze the data generated by the four experiments. We have more than 10,000 physicists around the, uh, around the world as well analyzing that. We do it, the grid is set up in this tiers hierarchy. At the center of this plot is the tier zero. Um, interesting. Yeah, is it, is it you changing the slides or is it on a timer? <laughs> because they seem to go quickly. Yeah. So the tier zero, based at CERN and with a backup center in Hungary, connected by uh, multiple 100 gigabit links, um, do the data recording, reconstruction, and distribution. The tier one centers, of which there are 13 around the world, the, the main center at RAL is one of those 13, does the permanent storage, that's where we have the tapes, etc., and the reprocessing of the data and some analysis. And then the tier two centers, of which we have about 150, do the simulation. A lot of the physics needs detailed simulation to understand the, uh, the backgrounds and the, uh, the systematics and the errors in, in the... Uh, in the various analyses, and then the end user analysis as well. So we have something like uh, 750,000 CPU cores. We've got more than an exabyte of storage distributed across the world. More than 2 million jobs run per day. And the networking that we use connecting all of this together is typically a minimum of 10 gigabits a second. Lots of sites now are 100, 100 gig, and the main sort of um, transatlantic connections are multiple 100 gig links, right? So next slide, please. So in terms of the, uh, of the sites here, you see that uh, the, uh, the, the, the yellow star is the tier zero in, in Geneva. The, uh, the green um, markers are the tier ones and the, the other color, the, uh, all the tier twos. What about the UK? So we've got one of the largest distributed uh, contributors to the WLCG. We actually uh, got the funding from SDFC to uh, um, to distribute across 19 uh, universities and, and Rutherford across the UK, and those are the various centres, and that's uh, our job is to provide the UK part of WLCG. So networking. Um, we do, of course, use the, uh, the standard academic research and education backbone, so um, I'm sure those of you, uh, many of you in the room are aware of the Géant uh, network operated by the Géant Association, c connecting together all of the national NRENs, the research and education networks at various, uh, various speeds. Um, next slide. And then, importantly, Géant is then, of course, connected to the rest of the world, um, across to, the, to ESnet with multiple 100 gig links, and, uh, um, well, literally the whole world, so, which, of course, is important to WLCG being a global infrastructure. And there are things like, you know, there's ESnet in the States and Internet2 and what have you, uh, the, the many networks. However, and the, on to the next slide. Oh, so this is just to show you, this is, uh, as you know, the Janet uh, um, operated by JISC in the, in the UK is the, the UK NREN, which is all part of that, and all universities and groups are connected to Janet. So LHC OPN is the important... Um, addition to all of this from the networking point of view, it was realized that we would have high requirements in terms of data transport. We needed at least 10 gigabits a second. Many of them are now 40 gig or 100 gig. And we, we fill these 24 hours a day, seven days a week with data transfer going around. And so these are private optical paths provided for us to link CERN to the various tier ones, um, which don't then impinge on the, uh, the, the general uh, Géant uh, network. And then the next, next slide, this is an even more complex one. This is a level three virtual private network running over the various uh, networks that actually, for, for the benefit of, you know, run by all of the NRENs in the countries, they allow um, control, better control and isolation and monitoring of the high energy physics traffic. This was the easy bit for IPv6. All of this works, right? I mean, networks are wonderful. They've been forwarding IPv6 packets for years. So if we could uh, then move on. So what about data transfers? Now, this is, a, this is worth an hour's topic in itself, right? This is to be able to transfer reliably high-speed data from point A to point B is not easy. And we all know of the... Uh, 
the standard problems of TCP IP that, you know, if you don't get the, the buffer sizes and the window sizes correct and they use multiple channels to actually uh, um, get high throughput. And so there's been a lot of activity over many years of how best to do it. And right now, between the most of the centers, the bulk data in, in, uh, in WLCG uses FTS3, version 3, and grid FTP um, to transfer. However, this was following the model that we would always transfer the data and then do the, uh, the processing locally. Um, what we're realizing now is that the networks are so performant and so reliable that we can actually run jobs on one, one area and open over the network the, the remote data. And that's happening with this uh, protocol, the uh, homegrown Hydrophysics protocol called XRoot D. So next slide, just two slides here on the... Uh, so Globus Grid FTP was uh, developed a long time ago. It was the extension of the standard FTP protocol for high performance operations and for security to allow the, the grid security infrastructure to work. It was standardized through the Open Grid Forum many years ago. And this, we've been using the implementation provided by the Globus Alliance that does parallel TCP streams, optimal TCP buffers, non-TCP protocols such as UDT, the reliable UDP. Um, multicasting, overlay routing. I'm not an expert on any of this, so I, I don't know the details, but, uh, and then the various security options. But it's, uh, it's been our main support for reliable high-speed data transfers. And because we were using multiple protocols, the experiments decided they needed something on top of that. So the file transfer service is the thing which gives the really reliable layer that sits on top of uh, multiple protocols and multiple standard, all with standard APIs. It's supposed to need zero configuration, does web monitoring and a web interface. And uh, importantly, allows um, people sitting at the web interface to do a third party transfer between a remote, a remote source and a remote destination. And then FTS takes care of that happening. So that was one of the challenges we had to make all of that IPv6. So now I finally get on to uh, why IPv6. So like many people, we started thinking about, actually, I should just rewind a little bit. I personally was very involved with the previous trans network transition we did, which was DECnet OSI, back with VMS in the 90s. There's nobody here old enough to remember all of those days. <laughs> That was 16-bit addressing, 16-bit addressing, so we ran out. We, we had a, a joint network, worldwide network between high geophysics and the space, NASA and the European Space Agency, and we did the transition to OSI transport and the OSI network in the early 80s, all at the same, uh, in the early 90s, all at the same time that next generation IP was being talked about, and we were kept pushing, saying, they should just use OSI transport. <laughs> it didn't happen, of course. So we were very much aware of the IPv6 stuff happening at the same time as we were doing that transition. So it was quite natural that, you know, when we saw that IPv4 addresses were running out, um, that we should sort of think about using IPv6. Um, however, there was this big concern, like everybody had, this, will the transition ever happen? Is it going to happen? They've been talking about it for years. And then, so we, we decided in, to, uh, in 2010, which was about the start of the LHC um, experiments, that we should actually look and see what the situation was. Um, we did a survey of all of, of the 18 major sites around the world. The one message was that all of the networks were ready. The national, the NRENs, they, they were all ready to, 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 uh, to forward IPv6 packets for us. They'd got the naming set up. Um, but the universities and the labs were not. They hadn't even thought about it. And on top of that, some were already reporting at that stage lack of IPv4 addressing. So we thought, well, it could be that in the not too distant future we might run out, including importantly CERN. CERN was saying that they were about to run out. There was an explosion of uh, virtualization and everything, and they were using up all their routable IPv4 addresses. And then in November of 2010, two other things happened. IANA then announced its um, imminent uh, running out of IPv4 and the fact that the regional authorities would also run out. Um, and then our US colleagues reported that they'd received a, a memo via the, you know, from the president via the US federal CIO saying that all executive departments, including the Department of Energy, which does particle physics, that uh, they needed to be IPv6 compliant within the next two years. And we were aware that we may actually have offers of opportunistic cloud resources. The cloud was starting to be talked about, which could be IPv6 only. 
We realised we'd got of order 50 applications that needed to be looked at to see whether they were compliant. Almost without exception, every developer had dug down into the network layer and done their own network address handling and all sorts of things. So there were a complete mess. And we realised it was going to take us ages to get there, so we'd better get started. So we decided to start a, a working group, which I chaired from April 2011 onwards. OK, next slide. So, and, uh, so just a, f a quick overview of the sort of things we did early on. So we did a full analysis of the, of the not only the software, the operating systems were fine in general. We, we predominantly used Linux um, for analysis. That was all working. But there were lots and lots of applications and, uh, and various tools as well. We realized we'd got operational tools. All of the security teams were looking at security logs and all of these things had to be made IPv6 compliant. And so, and we also, we were not able to uh, interfere with production running as the, the experiments were just starting up. We mustn't touch anything, mustn't break anything. So we decided to run a test bed. So in 2012, CERN announced the shortage of uh, IPv4 addresses. The uh, um, we had good engagement with all of the experiments, and we were t testing things, and things seemed to work at the fundamental level. So let me just uh, flash over a few of these other early things and then get to some of the longer stuff. So during 2013, we successfully ran on our test bed more than two petabytes of data transfer. The success rate was greater than 87%, which was very good. Next slide. And then we started, this was the major thing, we started looking at the data management software, the data storage technologies, and the data transfer, and this turned out to be a much bigger problem than we thought. We had originally thought we could actually support IPv6 only in 2014, and it was during this, these two years that we realized it was going to be much later. There was a lot of activity needed to be done with the, uh, the various developers and, the, and uh, the sort of the networking tech, so data transfer technology we were using. Next slide. 2015, we'd done quite well with a number of sites uh, being ready. Um, we realized that the, the use model was, was such that what we needed to concentrate on first was to get dual stack storage services everywhere so that IPv6 only CPU could access the data. Next slide. Um, next slide. So we continued in 2016 to push for starting to put some of these services in production. We'd proved that it didn't actually break anything. Um, we did the Perfsona end-to-end network monitoring, which I'll tell you about shortly. And Lots of operational stuff. The next talk's about IPv6 security. We realized that you know, being ready for IPv6 security was extremely important. So we wrote a, um, a paper on that, and that's a topic in itself. We had management board buy-in at the end of IP, um, 2016 to say that uh, we would actually officially start to support um, IPv6 only CPU in 2017, and we asked people to do it by 2018. Next slide. We've been counting various things. This is from our information catalog of how many services are um, IPv6 uh, capable, reachable. This says 25%. This was a month before Christmas. I looked yesterday and didn't have time to update the slide. This is now 35% of the, of the storage. Lots of people have been uh, um, moving services in recent weeks. Next slide. The data storage at CERN turned on to be, it had been internally IPv6 for a long time. CERN has been an IPv6 site for several years now, but they turned on the external view of their EOS um, storage software in January, and you can see here's the plot of IPv6 traffic to the general internet to and from at CERN, and you can see it at the point at which it turned on, immediately they got uh, traffic from all of the capable stuff outside. Next slide. So we've been tracking, and importantly, we've been tracking the, uh, the tier twos, which I'll concentrate on. The largest blocker is where the physics cluster is ready, but then the site's networking team has not yet done the transition. Next slide. So here's one of the, uh, of the counts, and this we were very pleased that by the end of 2018, we did reach more than 50% of the tier twos were now uh, IPv6 capable. This means that we've tested storage. The experiments have confirmed that IPv6 access to the storage works. Here are the, the, uh, um, the details for each of the regions. So done means done. In progress means that it's going to be ready 
within weeks from now, on hold means we're waiting for the, uh, the uh, university campus networking team to, uh, to, to, to provide the, uh, the naming and the routing. Next slide. So as of now, here are the four experiments, the fraction of the tier two uh, uh, storage that's available. Uh, overall, it's 49% in the UK. 53% of our storage is now IPv6 reachable. Next slide. Here are some nice plots tracking what's happened during 2018. So this is the, the status of the tier twos, the top plot. So you see that the, uh, sorry, I'm pointing at a screen here, which you've got multiple screens. There's a, there's a green, green line that goes from 10% to 50%. That's the amount that were done during the year. Um, the blue line decreasing is the amount we hadn't, sites we hadn't heard from. And then the number on hold and the number in progress is, is reducing. So that's, that's well on track to be 100% uh, um, in the not too distant future. The transfer, if we could just go back to the previous slide, this, the, the transfer on the bottom plot there is showing that um, the IPv6 transfers were running at about two gigabytes per second. Is that gigabytes or gigabits? Probably gigabytes, I think. Uh, the, uh, at the start of the year and seven at the end, so there's been a gradual increase. Next slide, so this is during one month. There's a, there's a bin here in the histogram for each day of the month, and you can see that there is significant IPv6 in total of the 93 and a half petabytes that was transferred over the data, 22.4 um, was, uh, was IPv6, so it's about running at about 24%. So, next slide. So end-to-end -end network monitoring, this is, uh, my final topic, and this is an important one. I don't know how many of you have heard of or know of Perf Sonar. We found very early on in high energy physics networking that the end-to-end -end network monitoring was very important to actually say from one site to another exactly what was happening because we had multiple networks and providers in between, and just tracking the individual network links was not sufficient. We always found that all the network providers always said, well, it's not our problem, it's their problem, right? So it was, it was very good to have some mechanism of actually recording and uh, measuring what performance the end applications would see in terms of round trip time, latency, loss, et cetera, et cetera. And this is being used extensively now, not only by particle physics, by, but, but by many sciences. So it's developed by ESNet, Giant, Indiana, and Internet2. There's links here. WLCG's goals here are to find and isolate network problems, characterize the network use, um, such as finding baseline performance, and in future actually use this in uh, automatic software uh, uh, use of the sort of defining the networks for, for higher level services. Okay. And here are the dashboards that we've got. It's all IPv6 uh, capable, so the dashboard with the uh, IPv4 on the left and IPv6 on the right. Next slide. And you can do things looking at the throughput and latency and packet loss and everything in the history. And this is very good for troubleshooting. You know, when you, somebody reports there's been a problem that started last Tuesday, we can go in and look and see what's going on there. And it was crucial that this was able to measure IPv6 as well as IPv4. So final slides. Oh, OK, so grid PP, this is just a plot here that shows that the grid PP is of the tier two is 53% is, uh, is now IPv6 capable. Final words on not everything went smoothly. Why did it take us so long? There have been many blocking issues outside of our own control, both in terms of the software and the applications, as I said. Many developers will claim that their software is fully IPv6 compliant until you test it. It's, it's nothing like being the first ones to test things to find all of the issues. On the whole, I should say that we've had very good response from the developers of the story store and their great willingness to try to fix things. All of the standard stuff, I mean, we had you know, lots of configuration errors in sites when people turn on IPv6 routing things, you know, don't always work as, uh, um, and I'm sure you guys are aware of those sort of things that uh, can go wrong when you first start doing something. But, you know, obviously the software and protocols um, not allowing for, um, more than the 32-bit uh, addressing, th th this perennial uh, assumption that there's only one network address for a, uh, um, um, an interface and not actually looping over all of the interfaces and all of the, uh, the addresses to make sure that they've chosen the correct one. Um, 
performance differences. We don't want there to be performance differences between IPv4 and IPv6. We don't want different network paths. We don't want different security models. Um, a lot of the time we've been looking at things like that. And, and we will have um, cases where both ends are dual stack, and yet the transfers are still going over IPv4, so we have to understand why is that. And that's been a lot of the work and continues to be so. Training and experience is very important. We've got lots of people who've got years and years and years and years of IPv4 experience and very little IPv6. So my last slide. Um, in summary, we need to be ready by the start of run three. We're now in a shutdown. Run three starts in 2021, and we want to be fully capable of uh, supporting opportunistic uh, CPU that would be IPv6 only. And I think after years of work, by the end of 2018, we've now proved that things work and we're, we're well on the way. Two thirds of the tier one storage and half of the tier two storage is now accessible, and the volume of data transfer in, in, continues to increase. 50% of these personas are monitoring hosts now reporting IPv6 enabled. And one final message is that because we were often in many of the universities and many of the labs the first people to ask for it, we've had an effect on the fact that there's 170 research institutes around the world who are now capable of uh, handling IPv6 uh, traffic. So, thank you very much. I've run over a bit, I'm sorry. Thank you, David, and uh, thank you for um, plugging on despite the uh, technical glitch that we had there. Um, do we have any questions for David? Hi, David. David Holder from Orion. Um, one quick question. On an earlier slide, you had a measure for IPv6 only clients. Um, it looked as though it was zero. Is that, is that correct? Or are you seeing parts of your network move to IPv6 ah, okay. only? So Did I understand the, the that, metric? Or? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Now, the, the, in terms of IPv6 only, we've, uh, apart from test situations, we, we, even though we officially support it, we have not had anybody requesting to do it. We have tested it in at least two sites that it does work. We are doing production work on IPv6 only worker nodes. Physicists blissfully unaware that this is all working, but, uh, but in, in anger, we don't have any yet. No, we want to get the storage up to sufficient amounts to uh, um, allow it to turn on. If somebody requested it, we could support it, but they haven't requested it. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Bob Slay from BT. Um, does that mean then that you've not managed to address your IPv4 exhaustion in any way because you're not running anything IPv6 only? So, well, we've, uh, we have a lot of uh, people who are still using NAT behind, you know, the, the big worker node clusters. We don't want to do that, but many people do, and yeah, so we've, we're coping. Right? This is a, nobody has yet run out. CERN managed to get another few Class B networks from somewhere. I don't know how they did it. But <laughs> okay, thank you, David. Okay.